Thank you very much, Adrian. So um, uh, I'm going to just continue a couple of themes that Brian and, uh, and Laura already alluded to. Um, this title was given to me, I think, by Adrian. I'm not exactly sure um, I would have chosen this title, but I'll try to I'll try to weave all of these things together, as well as doing a little bit of a look back to some of the points that both Brian and, uh, and Laura brought up. Uh, let me start by saying that um, I think many of us, and certainly the FDA, would say that RCTs are held up as the gold standard, but gosh, they're so crushing, as we heard from Laura, they can be exhausting, and they're incredibly slow and frustrating. Uh, they're expensive, hard, cumbersome. The, an the answers get here too late, and they're both too narrow and too broad. They have a very tightly set, set of inclusion criteria, and you think, oh, it doesn't apply to my patient, and so on. And they're often not patient-friendly. Um, you don't really want to be the person that got placebo when it turns out the drug could have been life-saving. Uh, in contrast, we have an explosion of people saying with all these curated EHR data sets, hey, real-world evidence, um, uh, that, that'll give us the insights we need. And then people say, yes, but you don't really have a strong structure for causal inference. I'm not sitting here today to talk about the role of counterfactual frameworks or all sorts of non-randomized uh, designs to get causal inference, but rather to say um, that, look, a lot of the time we probably could still keep randomization for causal inference, we just need to unhook ourselves from the burden of traditional RCTs. And so then the issue is how can you make RCTs better? How can you make them smarter, giving personalized answer, and maybe considering multiple treatment options. So even in iSpy2, although they've gone through multiple drugs, each patient was still really just getting one question asked in that patient. And yet sometimes there's many things that you might be doing to the patient at the same time, certainly in the ICU, on the, aver the average patient has 50 orders written on admission to the ICU. And the certainty around many of those 50 things is who the hell knows. Uh, so consider multiple treatment options and yet also have it be safer, lower chance of getting bad treatment options, better odds in the trial than out of the trial. So let me just go back to the traditional RCT for a moment. So you start out with a bunch of people with a disease, a different amount of severity, you of course randomize, and then you look for a difference. And although you started at presumably 50-50, you maybe end with a successful trial at 99% or better, and you go, aha. Uh -huh. So then the question is, what's going on in the middle? And of course, we've all been raised with frequentist designs that we shouldn't be under looking under the hood, but imagine if you could. Imagine if you had the VIP preferred access and you looked under the hood and you were doing a trial that was maybe going to go to 400 patients and 40 patients in, half are getting A, half are getting B, and this is the survival here. Green is you're alive, red is dead. So the 41st patient turns up. Raise your hand if you're happy for it to be 50-50. It's your uncle. You're thinking, am I in my uncle's will? <laughs> you're How many of you are thinking 50-50? Of course you're not thinking 50-50 because it turns out that the probability that A is better than B is actually 78%, which will not get you published in the New England Journal of Medicine, but which is not 50-50. So how could you exploit that information? So imagine if in the next piece of the trial, you kept randomizing, but you weighted the die so that 78 out of 100 times it rolled to A. You took a bet. And if it turns out during that bet your bet was right, then you'd be done and dusted. Trial would be over 80 patients. What's this? This is a multi-arm bandit. It's a classic sort of the opening chapter of any textbook in reinforcement learning. It's a classic schematic of trying to work out, as you're trying to work out, do I put my money in one slot machine or do I move to another? I know something about one slot machine, but maybe the other slot machine has a better return. Let's think about trial designs that have this sort of embedded learning, a little bit like AI reinforcement learning. So at this point, you just stop the trial Response adaptive randomization, which you heard from both of the last speakers, is basically that. It's a multi-arm bandit. So you start the trial. You've got three options you're choosing from. The first few patients go in, they generate data. They go into a little Bayesian probability that runs best estimates on what's working, and then it changes the weight of the die. 
That's like moving from one state in a Markov model into a new state, where you then start changing the likelihood of getting some of the policies. Um, you can change the odds. You can even have rules for activating new arms and so on, for activating and dropping. And you can have different weights for different kinds of baseline characteristics, this notion of personalized medicine. So that's RAR. Both speakers talked about that. That's the essence of it. And that is not your father's RCT. Okay, let's go one step further. Let's automate this whole thing and put it inside the EHR. And then we're now beginning to think about even leaving RCTs and starting to move into blending RCTs with clinical care and thinking about this as a way of having smart clinical decision support. And that's the idea behind a platform that would do perpetual enrollment with continuous learning. It would be adaptive, matching the odds of success to assignment, multifactorial, where you could actually be testing multiple therapies within different domains and weighting them all for different kinds of subsets of patients. You could have the whole thing embedded inside the EHR and aligned with care, something Laura also is uh, pushing home, and yet keep randomization for causal inference. And this is the so-called remap design. And so in theory, you could take a situation in simulation where you were testing across eight agents. You don't know it, but in truth, Two of them are great with low mortality rates, and four of them are near lethal, but no one knows. And if you're running in these trials, at this point, 2,000 patients in, for example, in a large healthcare system, so you haven't answered the question, but in gray bars, you can see that the algorithm was putting everyone, even before it got to knowing the final trial result, during the trial, it was pushing all the patients even early on, it started taking bets on the two best performing arms. It was blind to the actual truth, but it was taking the bets. And so there were far fewer patients dying in care, even while you were still trying to get to a tolerable threshold of uncertainty to actually publish the winning arm. So these designs are smarter in that they consider many different treatment options. You can vary the options depending on the patient and they're actually potentially safer, probably playing what is probably the winner. And so you're actually safer, if the rest of the world doesn't know the answer, you're safer in the trial than out of the trial. So let me give you an example of an actual remap that we stood up in response to COVID. So remap cap is now stood up, stood up across several hundred sites across the world. We've enrolled over 9,000 patients and we've actually the average patient has been in almost two separate questions at a time. So they're getting randomized in multiple domains. So there's over 16,000 randomizations. We're coordinating it all over the place. We actually work with the Berry consultants, which is the same group behind iSpy2, and who we've now signed an agreement with UPMC for a variety of things. So we have these domains. So every domain is a clinical area, like a choice of antibiotic or giving steroids, antivirals, et cetera. And then interventions are all the different arms within the domains. And then regimens are like your menu options. What did you choose for dessert? What did you choose for starter? What did you choose for main course? And then we just bring the whole meal all at one time. And so when a patient goes in, and then we can have different strata for subgroups of patients. So when a patient goes into the trial, they arrive, for example, with severe COVID. We have different strata for severe versus moderate. They get assigned their little randomized recipe, and then we wait just 21 days and then count up whether they lived or died and how much organ support they had. So here are some of the domains we've been testing in the sicker ICU patients. And to give you an idea, again, of how this is not your father's RCT, you know how many treatment regimens are on this screen? 194,000 separate recipes. This is not a two-arm trial. This is a massive learning platform where you're combing across a huge space of variable combinations. And it's been successful. So it, we started this where 
since it was in March of last year, we've already had, we uh, published on steroids in JAMA, we published on IL-6 inhibitors in the New England. We then just published last month with two more New England papers on anticoagulation with differential effects by kind of COVID. And we've now just got another paper coming out in JAMA. So it's five or six papers in JAMA in New England in 12 months from one trial. Now, that's only one barometer of success, but it, it gives you a sense of the scale of contribution from one learning platform. At UPMC, we were interested in uh, putting the whole thing fully inside our EHR. Um, we embraced this vision that in, in theory, you could be running lots of questions uh, where you were constantly trying to go into existing care, bring in new ideas, put it through this sort of RAR rinse cycle, spit out the bad stuff, and continuously learn. Um, our first version is pretty clumsy. This is what it took to take sort of a standard RCT process and fully embed it into, well, we run Cerner, we run multiple versions of Epic. It wasn't entirely effortless, but we did manage to put the entire trial structure into all of our EHR so that every single hospital in our system could enroll patients. So the vast majority of hospitals here are not ever doing clinical research normally. UPMC enrolls in our big flagship university hospitals. We don't do trials out in the middle of the Allegheny Forest, but now we do. So we ran this trial across our entire system. And furthermore, as soon as we had a positive result, we totally turned it on to make it standard of care inside our system. So as the results came out, we then instantly, could, because everyone was socialized about going in and getting their instruction set, then when you went from a randomly assigned drug to now, oh, it, it totally works, we're just going to give it 100% time, we were able to instantly turn it on across the system. So knowledge transfer, or KT, went to zero. In other words, the day after we knew hydrocortisone works, hydrocortisone was in everyone's menu options across the system. Okay, so then we started thinking, well, now there's monoclonal antibodies. This, these are given as outpatients. We had a conversation with uh, the White House back in March, and it took us 21 days from the conversation with the White House to write a full study protocol to then stand up doing randomized assignment to all of the different monoclonal antibodies that we had in the system. We did this as a randomized therapeutic interchange. The physician ordered the monoclonal, and then we set up a system where when you made the order, it then sent a randomized instruction to the pharmacist about which monoclonal to pull off the shelf. They then came back to the physician and the patient, and the physician and the patient could say, oh, no, no, I want the Lilly monoclonal or I want the Regeneron. So they were allowed to override it, but presuming they didn't, then they were happy to take it. We have had zero physicians and zero patients uh, express a preference beyond what was randomized because I don't think any of us in our room have any preferences either. Who cares which monoclonal you get? So when we start, stood this up, uh, before we started, uh, we were dribbling a little bit of monoclonal into a few patients. As we stood this up, we massively increased outreach all across the system. When we began this, um, African Americans were much less likely to get monoclonals in our system, contingent upon being PCR positive in comparison to white. That disparity was completely eradicated. We had a more than sevenfold boost across the system, we started putting monoclonals into everyone that met them. And so you can see here across, this is a map of Western and Central Pennsylvania. This was our rate of monoclonals per PCR positive before the trial and our rate of monoclonals afterwards. And we're not just putting 20 or 30% of our patients that get monoclonals in the trial, we're putting 100% of our patients. And we're currently randomizing almost 200 people a day into this program across our system. So, um, in conclusion, I think Bayesian adaptive platform trials can be embedded in the EHR, they can be deployed at scale, and they can be used as an instrument for causal continual learning and for closure of the knowledge translation gap. That, thanks very much. <laughs>